All right, I'm going to start from the beginning. This is a talk about transhumanism in particular. So uh, I don't know what anybody would have thought about the term transhumanism before they got here. Like anybody, have you heard of the term before? Raise your hand if you have. All right, okay, everybody's heard of it. Good, good. So, not everybody. Not everybody. Pretty much everybody, though. I'm sorry. I'm thinking Democratic majority here. Uh, so tra I'm going to pick someone from random, someone who did raise their hands. You here. Uh, yeah, transhumanism. What is uh, what is it that you've heard of the term transhumanism? Is when uh, humanity has reached the point where the technology and they basically human and technology is still one. Okay, so he says the point where humans and technology become one sometime in the future where it happens. Anybody else uh, offer it transhumanism they may have heard of? You? Go ahead. Taking a somewhat more proactive approach to human development as sort of as an individual body and as a species. Okay, so uh, I don't even know how to reiterate that one, but uh, hopefully everybody heard that. All right, so basically what I want to say about transhumanism is that you can take it in a few different ways. You can take it as something like a singularity approach where there is, uh, okay, there's also multiple definitions of singularity, so I won't even go into that. Uh, I like to use Eliezer Yudkowsky's definition of transhumanism as simplified humanism. So humanism is a philosophy which says that the proper valuation of uh, right, wrong, good, bad, benefit, uh, detriment is humans and things that happen to humans, things that are about humans, and human is the scale to work from. So transhumanism says simply that uh, there's a hope and a promise. The original uh, transhumanist, uh, even before the extropians, are saying that technology will eventually come to a point in the future where things are going to be possible and people may become a little bit more enhanced or better than their original selves. That's the very simple transhumanist type of talk. So a hope and a promise. The hope is that things will actually be able to uh, augment our human frames as frail or however they may be. And the promise is that technology will simply continue to get better and better. So, Eliezer Yudkowsky gives a, uh, an example. If you see a six-year-old girl <laughs> laying on the train track somewhere and you have the ability to actually help this girl, is it right to help her? to take her off the tracks to actually save her life? And he says, yes, yes it is. No, life is good. And he says, well, what if there's an old man, a man who's 90 years old, and he's sick and he's dying? Would you have the ability to actually cure him, help him, and give him more life than he already has? And he says, is this a good thing? Yes, simple answer. He says there are complicated answers to things, but sometimes there are simple answers to things. This is a simple answer, yes. And he says, well, how far can we extend this? Life is good. Life is beneficial. What if the person is going to live an extra 50 years from 90 or an extra 100 years? Is there some upper limit to it? And so some people would say, yes, there's some sort of upper limit where life is no longer worth living. And Eliezer rejects that, saying that no, there really isn't. Simplified transhumanism, simplified humanism is that yes, life is good, intelligence is good, all these wonderful things about humans and human qualities are good things, and we should maintain them as long as we can. So that is the, the hope and the promise. Now, I wanted to also talk about, uh, in addition, um, the levelers. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this uh, group of the English Civil War, the levelers. No? Okay. Uh, okay, we have a few people who have heard of the levelers. Uh, I wasn't surprised you heard of the levelers. Uh, in fact, I looked up your piece on it beforehand. Uh, so, during the English Civil War, first, second, and it's basically a one decade period between 1640 and 1649 or so, uh, Murray Rothbard refers to the levelers as the first self consciously libertarian movement in the Western world. Uh, they believed in uh, natural rights, either God-given or innate in humanity, and they were, even though they were divided on lots of different things, whether they were you know, saying that we really need to limit the power of Parliament or limit the power of kings or whatever it was, uh, later in 1649 there was at least some coherent thing of what they were against, and they were against uh, parliamentary privilege. And so the levelers were called levelers so-called because people thought they were trying to bring everything down to uh, some common level. And people who fought the leveler label saying they were levelers so-called are saying, no, they're not trying to bring everything down. We're trying to raise people up. 
but you're being you're forcing them down, particularly uh, parliamentary um, corruption. So uh, parliament has the power to actually give out favors to certain people. And so if we want to bring things back to a uh, level playing field, we have to eliminate the ability of uh, par parliament or king or congress or whatever to do these things. And that's leveling. And so I think that the levelers are probably a, a interesting uh, thought experiment for what's going to happen in the future. Uh, first thing that's going to happen is uh, something that's uh, starting right now, which is a 3D printing revolution. So 3D printing, anybody uh, heard of additive uh, printing, 3D manufacturing, things like that? Okay. It's, uh, it's at a primitive level right now. You can probably print a few screws, uh, print a few plastic parts, models, things like that. But in the next few years, things are actually going to become a lot better. You'll not only be able to print plastic parts, you'll be able to print metal parts. You'll be able to print things out of glass. You'll be able to print things out of vegetable matter and, and uh, protein matter as well. And the actual cost of shipping things from one place to another will simply, you know, uh, disintegrate. You won't need to ship so many things, finished products as they are. You'll need raw materials, plastic bits, uh, protein bits, uh, wood, composite, composite. Uh, then you can get that anywhere for pennies, usually per pound. Keeping that in store inside a 3D printing area, you can actually send plans for whatever needs to be constructed over the internet, and the person at home or wherever it is can print out whatever they need to do. So instead of going down to the IKEA, whatever it is, picking out a table or chairs or something like that, you can simply get the plans off of the internet and print it yourself in, at the, uh, in your own home. Whether it's plastic utensils, metal utensils, cups, uh, dishes, uh, even fabrics later on that you'll be able to do. So this will be a worldwide um, no, revolution in things that people will be able to do inside their own homes. Or even, and if they can't do it in their own homes, a larger center where they can simply pick up things that are made of parts. Uh, right now, capital uh, is rather expensive. It's, it's prohibitive to actually make the uh, factory that you would need to make a car or a car part or something like that. And it's rather hard to actually get into get that billion dollars you'd need to build up a car plant or some other factory that you need. And in order to actually pay back the billion dollars that you need to build the thing in the first place, you'd have to make millions of whatever parts it is, and then sell all of them, make a profit on all of them, pay down the uh, this amortization costs uh, for your capital investment. And with additive manufacturing, you won't need to do any of that anymore. You'll have parts that are printed on demand. If you need 10 parts, you can simply print 10 parts. Instead of getting a machine that needs to print a million parts in order to pay for itself, you can simply print off what needs to be printed off. So if you're in the third world or something and you, all of a sudden you don't have access to, say, um, whatever it is that people in the first world may have, you know, whether it be really good utensils, really good medical equipment, really good supplies of some kind, you can simply send it through a connection. They'll be able to print it using basic parts, plastic bits, pellets, whatever it is, and they will have access to the same thing. Instead of having to build up big capital in some other place around the world, or you to invest all these things, uh, they'll be able to do it themselves. And this process will begin an actual leveling process. Um, I don't know if uh, how many of you heard of Kevin Carson? Carson? Okay, a couple of people have heard of Carson. Uh, all right, there's... Carson would like, uh, he gives talks about uh, Benjamin Tucker, or not gives talks. We, we don't actually know if he gives talks or not. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if any, but only a few people have ever met uh, Benjamin, uh, not Benjamin Tucker, but Kevin Carson. And we don't really know if they're telling the truth. Uh, but yeah, he would give uh, the examples of Benjamin Tucker's uh, four monopolies. And the monopolies are allowing uh, these so-called private corporations or uh, large um, firms to take advantage of uh, economies of scale or things that are, um, let's see, I don't know how to explain this best. <laughs> But large capital is actually able to do things that people without access to that capital can do. But this 3D printing revolution actually lowers that uh, barrier to entry into this, uh, amazing, uh, uh, this amazing world of production. So you'll see this all over the world happening. Large corporations simply won't be able to compete anymore. Uh, with the death of IP, uh, because people are simply ignoring any kind of intellectual property laws, uh, people will simply print off what needs to be printed off. If you need these new Nike shoes and you don't want to have to pay Nike, you can get the plans that somebody had already put up on the internet and print up your own Nike shoes if that's what you wanted to do. And 
at that point, a lot of the, uh, the advantages the corporations had, whether they were intellectual property protections or the fact that nobody else could compete with them on capital because they'd already made this investment, they will simply evaporate. But the world looks like a very, very different place at that point when these large corporations and the governments that support them are no longer able to suppress people and they can no longer grant the privileges to these uh, corporations to do these things anymore. So it's a very radically different vision, and this is actually rather near term. I'm talking things about in the next, say, 10 to 15 years. So in about, uh, about 2020 to 2025, the world looks like a very, very different place. So so things just to be prepared for as time goes on. So in that world, of the transformed world, which is probably slightly more level, uh, no longer, no, uh, as uh, uh, wide income disparity or wealth disparity as already exists right now between large capital owners and regular people, the ideas of transhumanism start to come in. Now, a lot of transhumanists uh, subscribe to a philosophy, not just of transhumanism, but of extropianism. And extropianism came about in the late 1980s and early 1990s by a guy named Max Moore. Now, philosopher Max Moore was explicitly an anarchist libertarian, and now he likes to downplay that. Uh, I'm not going to say that his wife is explicitly involved in the downplaying of that thing, but I'm going to strongly hint that that's the case. Um, so what he has uh, been He's saying... He's still patriarchy, too. So how's that work? Well, <laughs> not everybody's perfect. Like He's everybody. a hand-packed patriarch? <laughs> He's a fun guy. He's a very fun guy. Uh, but uh, the this liberatory anarchist philosophy of extropianism uh, is going to take, or not is going to take, but had taken the ideas of transhumanism to a level of... Uh, uh, libertarian anarchy, like how it makes it a lot more possible to actually do some things. Right now, um, it's difficult to actually go out and make your own nation, or make your own countries. The Seasteaders or the Free State Project people are going to find out, or have found out. It's very hard to actually do some things. But with the uh, advent of much more advanced technology, things like uh, 3D printing, and eventually real nanotechnology, uh, then you will be able to actually start doing something. With nanotechnology, you should be able to uh, not only grant yourself immortality and you know become a god or whatever it is, but probably a lot more low scale. You should be able to make your own defenses if that's what you want to do. You could grow your own weapon parts inside your house, and if you wanted to defend yourself from any kind of attacks, you probably could. If you wanted to create some sort of uh, shield around yourself that you couldn't be uh, couldn't be penetrated by gases or poisons or bullets or whatever it is, yes, you could probably do that as well if you get to real advanced nanotechnology. But a combination of 3D printing, nanotechnology, the genetics revolution that we're already in, the robotics revolution that was to come with the artificial intelligence and everything else, would lead to a very different version of humanity. So there are other with artificial intelligence in particular, there would be other sentient creatures on the planet besides human beings. And the definition of what is human has to start to expand to either accommodate these things, or it can become very chauvinist, which is a, another possibility that some people have explored and I'm not going to go into. Um, but uh, so far, any questions? Because I think I'm, I feel like I'm rambling and I don't want to ramble so much. Yeah. Could you uh, explain uh, extropianism further? Okay, all right. But, uh, Max Moore gave uh, the idea of extropianism. The word extropian is supposed to be a counter to, uh, well, it comes from extropy. And extropy is supposed to be a counter to entropy. Entropy is the uh, state of things in a closed system simply to wind down, become more and more chaotic and random, and eventually uh, settle out to zero, like a, um, well, that's basically the, the gist of it. The extropians are about doing the opposite of that. Instead of having more and more disorder and you know, randomness, it's more and more order, more and more um, you know, the better things rather than the worst things, more good rather than chaos. And the, the extropian philosophy is to simply uh, take the ideas of <laughs> life, and liberty, and expand them off uh, with intelligence throughout the rest of the universe. We're going to expand into the universe with intelligence and whatever we have. So that's kind of the extropian idea. Um, is that good or...? Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. So anybody else with the questions so far, what I've been talking about? Nick? Um, who are some of the big, like, heads of 
transhumanism? I mean, who would you recommend to read if you want to know more about transhumanism? Well, it's uh, a good question. I'd start with probably the uh, the World Transhumanist uh, Council used to be, but now they simply call themselves Humanity Plus. Uh, huh. They released a magazine which is called H Plus, and there are a lot of really good uh, things in there. So. They used to be a lot more explicitly libertarian anarchist, and then for a while they became a sort of uh, democratic transhumanist under the uh, guidance of James Hughes. But now it's become more libertarian again, which is a very good thing. Yeah. There's a book by Dr. Gregory Benford called Immortality, in which he predicts the end, end of aging within 40 years using genetic engineering. When did it, when's it start from? Pardon me? When was it written? It was written 10 years ago, but he was right. saying within 50 years. Okay, years oh, <laughs> correct. <laughs> All right. All right. So like, oh, it made a pretty, pretty good schedule. Yeah, uh, pretty so good. Yeah. that's one name. Uh, another name would be, say, like uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. if you know Aubrey de Grey, oh, very big beard, you'll see him on, yeah. yes, he looks kind of like that. <laughs> yeah, he's, um, you'll see him on TV, he's a uh, Cambridge Don. He originally started out as a computer guy, believe it or not, and he married a woman who got him more and more into the medical field, and that's how he got into medicine. And his main thing is to defeat aging. Aging is a scourge, aging is a disease, and to defeat this one thing, he thinks will be his greatest gift to uh, humanity forever. 100,000 people a day die of aging or age-related illnesses, which are all caused by aging in the first place. Eliminating aging and that kind of thing saves 100,000 people a day, and there's nothing else out there that could uh, compare to that kind of victory. So, like, go ahead, answer. As far as things from what Tennyson has already mentioned that are, that are already happening, the Global Village construction set is one of those, there you go. Um, including things like he was mentioning 3D printing. So this is a set of 50 open source tools. So the idea is that the, this set of tools one can build a, a town with modern amenities around. And eight of them have already been prototyped. One of them is already, two, actually the tractor and the brick press are already for sale. Or you can buy them, and that, or you can just get the plans and make your own and then sell those to you maybe. So these are totally open sure. source that anybody could look at them, download the plans, change yeah. them, and do whatever they want? Participate in developing sure. the next uh, 42. So I'll leave this pile of flyers on the table. Yeah, th these kinds of things are exactly what's uh, going to happen more and more often in the future. So whatever parts that you think you may have needed for something, you need a new screw for whatever it is, you could simply print your own screws. Uh, do you need to get new blades for something, you could probably print your own blades for something like that. So there's lots of interesting stuff that's possible in the next just few years. Uh, there seems to be some overlap between being a transhumanist and being a libertarian anarchist. Uh, why is that? Uh, that's, that's a good question. A lot of the early transhumanists, a lot of the early uh, extropians seem to have had an affinity with libertarian philosophy. Or I don't, I'm not sure whether which was the cause or which was the effect, or whether there's just some weird correlation there, but uh, that seems to be it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, folks like uh, Ray Kurzweil, you know, people would think that he's no, not as libertarian as some others, but he's definitely more libertarian than some right, other people. Relatively you know. speaking. Relatively speaking, he's probably kind of like how uh, John Stossel's more libertarian than the average uh, newscaster. Yes. Yes. So, um, it's, it's a very good question. I haven't found this out myself. I've Paul McCrory would have been a science fiction fan too, I would suspect. That's yeah. also true. Now, I don't really know why science fiction fans, have, or fi science fiction in general, has been rather libertarian. I mean, uh, I think you, know, you yourself have written on some of this, mm -hmm. and... But it's a, a place to explore the entire idea of new worlds, yeah. what kind of things could Total exist that don't exist. It's pretty much a, a free idea to uh, escape. So maybe that's why it leads to libertarianism and that's the attraction. So Sam Conkin had lots of ideas about this as well. Uh, see, anything else that uh, I already said that you want to ask a question about? I'm thinking of some of these ideas, like uh, if you had nanotechnology that you could use to defend yourself, it makes the state obsolete. Pretty much. Uh, it just seems like one of the dangers of uh, the state being able to create these things first with the military industrial concept and then just using all of these technologies. This, this is a very good question. Now, a lot of the, uh, the problems that we have today are because, uh, well, I would say because of state intervention. And the fact that you, there isn't a lot of, uh, or the world of private investment that would exist, on the other hand, thinking of Bastiat's broken window, what we see before us now isn't what we what might have been uh, in another world. <coughs> but what we see before us now is pretty much the military and government-dominated research groups that would actually produce these first benefits. And having that in their hands could be incredibly dangerous. 
this is something that the father of nanotechnology, K. Eric Drexler, has talked about himself, even though he's not entirely libertarian, he's got some rather libertarian leanings and had a libertarian wife for a while. Uh, the government having nanotechnology, uh, I can't imagine them not using something to the most destructive and horrible ends you could imagine. Uh, think about the uh, uh, instance of uh, nuclear power. Once they had the ability to make atomic weapons, they did use them. And yeah, this is the kind of thing we have to fear from the government. But I think that everybody who is able to actually give uh, any contribution at all to the production of the future in 3D printing and nanotechnology should. And if they can get away from the government in doing so, definitely, definitely do it. If you have any kind of um, engineering background, chemical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, nano-electrical mechanical systems, then you, this is really the future. Uh, you can actually build it for yourself and make something of a paradise of the world possible. And this is what I really, really hope for. It's the kind of thing that keeps me uh, going sometimes. <laughs> the world could be a much, much better place. So I think of a world without disease, without poverty, without uh, hunger, without any of these other kinds of things, and it's, it could come. It could come within our lifetimes. And we know how to achieve them, we just have to build the tools. Okay. Right. What time is it now? It's uh, 4.25. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, any final questions? Good. question about aging. I mean, doesn't like, I, I mean, I don't know, flora and fauna, like age, I mean, how would that, I mean, I see how that can be stalled. That's true. As, yeah. far, as far as being prevented or like ending, yeah. I, I've never heard of such a concept ever. Uh, I would recommend uh, Aubrey de Grey's Ending Aging for this in particular. Uh, you can find the book online in PDF form if you want. I can actually give it to you right now if you want. Uh, but the idea is that, yes, things do age and things do decay and they do die. But uh, if we didn't want to do that anymore. We could probably find a way to prevent it from happening. The processes that make us age can probably be discovered, uh, whether it's accumulation in uh, cells, build up junk, any kind of thing. There are other people have other opinions of why people age. Whatever it is, uh, all of it should probably be treated at the same time. And instead of figuring out specifically what it is and trying to reverse those specific things, just Aubrey's plan is to attack all of it at once. So uh, go ahead. He wants to say something. I know about how that works. Good. You know how it works? Eh? Yes. Okay. Dr. Benford wrote at the end of every DNA strand, uh, is a little molecule called the telomere. Yeah. The strand has 37 telomeres. Every time the strand splits in half to reproduce the cell, one of them breaks off. And you've got 37 times, and that cell is done. Yeah. So. Certain cells don't do that. Right. Like uh, the helo cells, cancer cells, they are immortal. Yeah. So they just live and grow. There are cancer cells from 1951, the Helen Lake cells, mm -hmm. that are spread all over the world now in petri dishes. Yeah. And they're trying to use a chemical called telomerase to stop the telomeres from breaking off. Right. And when they do that, you're done with aging. All done. Yeah, this, uh, you, can, you will definitely die, yeah. but you won't age. Right. You can you can still be killed violently if that's the uh, the <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah. But there. We, we must turn ourselves into cancer. Uh, you could turn yourself into a cancer. To be a. Yeah. <laughs> it's not yet. It's like fortune, dude. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Um, wouldn't there be a concern if people do get rid of aging? Mm. So the only way you can die is through being. Or something. Yeah. But wouldn't, there, wouldn't that lead to an overpopulation problem? Yeah, these are the standard questions that people okay. ask whenever there's some sort of uh, proposal to end aging or have immortality. It's usually, well, what if Hitler was immortal, or what's going to happen with overpopulation, or those things like that. And everybody who advocates uh, no, non-death or eternal life or whatever it is has answers to those specific questions. So I'm not going to say that I have definitive answers to those questions. But I think first thing is a actual program of real liberalism or libertarianism would probably solve a lot of the overpopulation problem. Where people can go to other unpopulated places of the earth and construct and build and feel free to do what they want. Uh, the world already has about 7 billion people on it right now, but if you put all of them together in one spot, they'd probably take up less than 5% of the arable uh, land of the earth. And so the, you can build far, much, much farther, like billions and billions of more people if you really want to. 
and with that we'll also have network effect which allows technology to grow and people will be able to leave, leave the planet and go off into the solar system and eventually the rest of the galaxy if that's really what's needed. So the ultimate uh, answer to overpopulation. Another answer that people have given is the idea that well as people get richer and live longer and uh, infant mortality goes down, people simply stop having so many children. In fact, they'll have less than uh, regeneration, which is they'll have less than 2.1 kids. And that is the case in most Western countries today. They become rich, and they have uh, very good health care, and they simply stop having so many children. And perhaps at some point where there's an extreme version of health and uh, you know, really, really good uh, lifespans, people won't actually have to have any children ever again. And if they do, they could probably you know, go off into space if that's what they want. And another okay. example, yeah. one other thing would be like, well, if Hitler or Mao or Stalin was living forever, well, we could still shoot them in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that too. <laughs> I was going to ask a similar question, but more specifically about nutrition and how these people are able to sustain themselves. Okay, like, uh, s s which people? I don't oh, know. Oh, like, you know, you have people who aren't dying. How does, oh, okay. the, you know, agriculture and eating catch up? Okay. okay. Is that <laughs> something that's in within the subject of transhumanism? Or it's, is that? It's, it certainly is. Like, people have come up with ideas of how exactly can you go about feeding a population to 20 billion? Uh, this was one of the uh, subjects of the Singularity Summit um, over at uh, Google Enterprises there. So it's on. NASA Ames site. So NASA, Google got together and they sponsor a bunch of students and they answer big questions about the world and the possible future. And so they're definitely projects of what do we, uh, what do, we do to feed these people or house these people or what can you do. Uh, but then again, I think that might be the wrong way to look at it because it seems more like a central planner type of thing to me. Say like, well, how am I going to deal with all of these people? Rather than say like, people living freely will be able to solve the, uh, the problems on their own. So I think that might be the latter, having people solve things on their own is probably the best way to look at this. A growing population of people living longer, more intelligent, uh, in peaceful harmony with one another because fights over resources become a lot less relevant as resources can become abundant, uh, will simply be able to solve their own problems. Are you Again. familiar with uh, Dr. Weller's Dead Doctors Don't Lie? No, no, I'm not. Okay, yeah. he, he was a veterinarian. Okay. He was hired by Marlon Perkins to do autopsies on animals that died in the field. Okay. He did 30,000 autopsies oh. and discovered that every one of these animals died from a deficiency. Okay. Amino acids, minerals, whatever. Yeah. And so he went back to school, became an MD, and did 30,000 autopsies on humans who died yeah. of old age. And he said all deficiencies. And he made a list of minerals and vitamins that if you take them, 90 of them, that if you take them on a regular basis, uh, you'll live a long time. Okay. And he recommended colloidal minerals, all right. like they drink in uh, glacial melt yeah. in the Andes and in Afghanistan where the people live to be 120. Yeah, I've, I've heard some of this before, so I'm not sure about how much I agree with it though, but it's an interesting uh, area for study. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, and if you know any of that, that name at all, uh, he and a doctor friend of his wrote a book about how to live long enough to live forever, and he recommends these 200 supplements that he takes, which is basically he takes them every day. And he not only takes them, but he sells them as well, so take that with a grain of salt. Uh, <laughs> Are you still installed? Uh, no, I probably could. <laughs> next year, next year. Yeah. All right. So, I think that's is that good. Everyone have a grasp of what I'm going for. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yeah.